Satan fall like lightning I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony, this is my testimony. Hey. Oh, come together. Come together, sons and daughters. Bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, our God. Finish what he started. Oh, sing it! Our God will finish what he started. This is my testimony from death to life. This grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony.
Man, that was such a great worship. And, and guys, I just got a couple quick announcements for us right now. Hey, first and foremost, our focus on the fort. This is at Vincent Village. It's a great organization that helps people as they're going in between uh, just some difficult times. And we want to help them by donating soap and shampoo. And this would be a great opportunity to help an organization that is doing amazing things. And so soap and shampoo, you can deliver that to us locally. We have bins or you can ship that to us at 5335 Bass Road, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46808. We would love your donations to help this organization. Secondly, it is Friends Day. Friends Day next week is going to be awesome. June 26th, Friend Day. I'm excited because I get to preach that day. But I'm so excited because what we're trying to do is, is tell you, tell you guys to bring someone, to invite someone to church because we know that our church will grow with you guys. We know that as you invite people, that as you encourage people to know about God and start bringing them alongside, you're going to start bringing them to the church. You're going to start inviting them to hear about God's truth. And what I'd like to ask is don't just invite someone to Friend Day. Don't just invite someone to Sunday morning. But invite them to lunch afterwards. Invite them to a coffee beforehand. Make sure that you're focusing on a relationship, not just getting someone in the church. We would love for you guys to invite your friends. And hey, if you're online only, share this to a friend that you can think of who would love to hear this message today. Hey, share it with them and say, I think this could be an encouragement for you. I'd love for you to listen in. You can do that so easy. It'll take five seconds. I would love for you to just share that to a friend next week and just tell them, hey, man, I'm thinking of you, and I just want you to be a part of this awesome church that I call my church home. And so we've got that for you. And, and lastly, guys, I just want to say, if you are new here, we have an online connect card, and you can find that at thepointchurch.net slash connect. Uh, if you're new here, we would love for you to just fill out that card so we could get some information and just encourage you. We've got a gift that we would love to give you. It's an awesome ebook, and we would just love to start getting connected with you guys. Secondly, uh, on that card is prayer requests. And so this is for anybody. If you need prayer requests, our church gets to see those and pray for those every week. And so we would love for you to fill that form out, to put in that prayer request, and put in your name so we can pray for you specifically. Because we as a church believe in the power of prayer and how amazing it is to see that. Uh, we believe that God works through prayer. It's not just something we do because we're told to. It's something that is miraculous and that is moving. It's because we're giving up things to God. We're letting Him be in control. And we're offering that to Him. And so please, please, please put in those prayer requests. We'd love to pray for you. Now, we've got an awesome opportunity to hear our catch up with Caleb and get to hear more about the search process. Hello, Point Church. Caleb Kimmel here on behalf of the board of the Point. I want to update you on the search process for our next lead pastor. As many of you know, God has led our founding pastor, Ray, to retire. And just as God has led Ray to start the church, we are confident that God is preparing a new lead pastor that will help us further advance our mission of helping people find and follow Jesus. Now, last week, we shared that the pastoral search team had interviewed three national search firms. Our search team had a 100% unanimous agreement that we'd like to partner with Agora Search Group. The Agora Search Group, they have a great reputation for gaining a deep and insightful understanding of a church and then working diligently with us on our behalf in the discovery process of a new lead pastor that fits our values here at The Point. Now that we've selected a search firm, there's plenty of work to do and there's plenty of details to communicate as we move forward. But remember church, it is a process that will take some time. So please continue to be praying that God would lead us in this discovery process as we prepare for the next chapter of impact to unfold here at The Point Church. Our board, as you know, greatly values transparency and communication to you. So we're going to report back to you next week with additional details about where God leads us as you continue to pray. Thank you and God bless. Thank you so much, Caleb, for continuing to keep us so well informed and allowing us as a church to be a part of the process. And so, guys, right now, we've got an awesome opportunity. It is Father's Day, and our very own Caleb, who we just heard from, is going to give this message. And so, would you guys bow your heads with me and just pray for this message? Would you just pray with me right now? God, God we're so thankful for Caleb. We're so thankful for the gifts that you've given him. God, we are so thankful for the way in which he is reaching so many students through um, World Baseball Academy. God, we know that he has so much on his plate, and so we're so appreciative that he's taken on these extra roles at the Point Church through this time of transition. And God, we know right now that you have given him a word to speak to people. You have given him something that he feels that they need to hear. You have given him truth to speak. And so we ask that you would prepare our hearts, 
that you would ready us to listen to what he has to say, that you would open our minds and our eyes to see what you have for us today. God, I know you're going to do work, and I just thank you for Caleb's gifts, and I ask that we can encourage him as we hear from him today. In your wonderful and powerful name, amen. Hello, Point Church. Hey, happy Father's Day out there to all the dads. Hey, glad you're able to join us this morning. I'm Caleb Kimmel, interim pastor here at The Point. Now, I want each of you to imagine you're a first grade teacher and you gather your little six and seven year olds together on the carpet square for story time. You know, they're all excited. They got their stuffed animal on their lap. You smile into their innocent faces and you begin to tell a story. You say, hey, once upon a time, there was three little pigs. The three little pigs ended up at a brick house that was well constructed by the third pig. Now along came the big bad wolf, and he tried to blow the house down. But the house was too strong, and that wolf ran off in defeat. The three little pigs lived happily ever after. Now, imagine if you were to do this. Something would most likely happen. You'd see those cute little innocent first grade faces start to change. Those little smiles of engagement would soon turn to disapproval with little angry eyebrows pointing right back at you. I'm sure one of them would probably get a little fired up and say something like, Hey, that's not how you tell a story. That doesn't make any sense to tell it that way. You have to start at the beginning, you know, with the three little pigs leaving home, the straw house, the stick house, and the brick house. Start back at the real beginning. You know, friends, kids can be pretty unforgiving when you change a well-loved story. Even slight changes, they, they earn a child's immediate response. You know, I've learned that when reading stories to my own kids at bedtime, dads especially, you know the trick, right? You get tired, so you try to skip a few pages at one time. You know, come on, I know you've done it too. Usually, I get busted by my kids and they'll say, wait, that's not how it goes. Well, friends, we are in a summer series we're calling the story of Jesus, where we're going to be studying the book of Mark. And in Mark chapter 1, this is how the author Mark, this is how he begins the gospel. It's Mark chapter 1, verse 1. It says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. This is how Mark starts his account of Jesus' life. Even before we've had time to really figure out what the opening line means, Mark takes us further back into the past, into the words of an old prophet named Isaiah from centuries before. Now, wait a minute. That's not how the story begins, right? Come on, Mark. Go back to the angels, to Mary, the shepherds, the stable, the manger scene, right? All that good stuff. We don't want to skip the Christmas story and jump right into a dry, dusty wilderness where this interesting John the Baptist character, he's eating bugs and he's screaming about our sins. Now, a little background on Mark. You know, this is how Mark starts his account of Jesus. Now, if we were able to stand here and talk to Mark today and tell him to start at the beginning, you know what? He might be a little surprised. Because Mark, after all, he's one of the evangelists in the New Testament who is forever in a hurry to get the story of Jesus told. I mean, he writes at a breakneck speed, motoring through his narrative using his favorite little Greek adverb called euthus, which means immediately. Mark uses this phrase over 40 times. Everything in the book of Mark, it happens immediately, right now, fast. There's no time to lose. But in Mark's defense, you know, the real life account of Jesus, it needs to be told. And Mark does a great job at documenting Jesus' early ministry. So my job today is to overview chapter one, which feels like an impossible task for the time that we have. In fact, there's so much packed into just the first chapter, we could spend all summer just in chapter one. But I do want to give you a quick outline on what happens in chapter one, and then dig into one particular area. Now dads who are viewing out there today, it's Father's Day, and so this one area we'll dig into, it's got a theme built just for you, so tune in. The first, let's go over chapter one, and let's say in a breakneck speed to try and keep up with Mark's writing style. In chapter one, unlike the other gospel writers, you know, Matthew, Luke, and John, Mark, he assumes that this story of Jesus' birth that it's already known to his readers. Therefore, Mark jumps right into early years of Jesus' ministry. In Mark chapter 1, we start out with this role of John the Baptist who's announcing the coming of the Messiah. And this is what it says. It says, This was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Then we jump right into Jesus' baptism and Satan tempting Jesus in the wilderness. In verse 10 it says, Just as Jesus was coming up, out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. 
And then at once, the Spirit sent him out to the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and the angels attended to him. Then we jump into Jesus driving out an impure spirit. We jump to verse 22. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had, what? Authority. Not just as teachers of the law. Just then a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus said, Be quiet, come out of him. And then Mark jumps into Jesus' healing. He heals many. In fact, in verse 32, it says, That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He drove out many demons. And it says, But he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Now, a quick side note. See, Mark is writing during a time where there's eyewitnesses everywhere, right? And any of them could have easily disputed his writings if they were inaccurate. Therefore, he was under heavy cultural pressure to not misrepresent any of the details that he was witnessing or hearing about. Now we jump back into verse 35, and it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So Mark's helping document uh, Jesus' prayer life. And then in ver verse 40, as a man with leprosy, a man with leprosy came to him and bade him on his knees, If you are willing... Will you make me clean? Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. He said, I am willing. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Now, there's a lot going on here in Mark chapter 1. I'm flying through these various historical accounts and what took place within Jesus' early ministry. And we're just highlighting chapter 1. Mark has 16 chapters, so you know he does an extraordinary job at documenting all these historical accounts. But with all this going on, Verses 16 through 20 is where I want to dive in with our time together. Verse 16, it says, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said. I will send you out to fish for people. Now, another translation says, Follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. At once, there's that term again, at once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, again, immediately, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Wait, what? I mean, can you imagine fishing with your dad and some of his employees, and this guy comes along and says, hey, come follow me, and you hop out of the boat and immediately go? It's really an interesting response. But notice that Jesus didn't say, hey, guys. I have this religion I want you to follow. Now hop out the boat and let's go. No, he said the words, follow me. Friends, the Christian life is not a bunch of rules, regulations, and rituals. It is simply following Jesus. Now these men, I mean, literally had the opportunity to get out of the boat and literally follow Jesus. But what Jesus is communicating, salvation is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Look, when we follow Jesus, we begin to think less about I and more about what he desires for our life. Fishing for men, hey, it means that we want to bring people to Jesus. Did you ever wonder why Jesus asked these specific men, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, to be fishers of men? Well, I think it's simple because they were already fishermen, right? Think about it. They absolutely knew how to catch fish. It was their profession. It's how they made a living. It was their craft they had perfected over time, probably through generations of time. They knew how to catch fish. But notice Later on, Jesus, he called Matthew as well. And Matthew was a tax collector, but he didn't use the same terminology. But Matthew, he still went fishing anyway, in the form of hosting a dinner for all of his tax collecting buddies. Why? So they can meet Jesus. Look, friends, the point is that Jesus wants you and I to use whatever we are familiar with, whatever we're already good at or already doing, that's honorable, of course, and that he has gifted us with to bring people into relationship with him. You know, think about it. If you're in sales, he might say to you, follow me and you can sell the world's greatest gift, eternal life. If you're an educator or a teacher, he might say, follow me and you'll teach eternal life. What if you're in construction? He might have said, follow me and you will show people how to build a firm foundation. You know, maybe you're in banking or investment. He might say something like, follow me and help people make the best eternal investment in their life. If you're a physician or a doctor, follow me and I'll show you how to practice spiritual healing. You know, whatever you do, Jesus wants to use you, wants to use what you know to bring people into relationship with him. So he might say to you, follow me, and you can fill in the blank. But it is Father's Day, and Jesus did talk about fishing. 
for people to four fishermen. So I wanna share with you four fishing tips. But of course, you can apply these to whatever field you work in as well. Now the first fishing tip, good fishermen position themselves where the fish are located. Right? I'm not sure about you, but you might have seen this funny Indiana pothole picture where this guy is fishing in the middle of the road. Well, one, it represents the crazy weather we have here in Indiana where sometimes we get four seasons all in one week. Now, this pothole does have water in it, but obviously, well, it gets the wrong place to fish because there ain't any more fish in there, right? Friends, you'll never catch fish until you're willing to leave your house and position yourself in proximity to where the fish are actually located. You know, the Great Commission says, therefore, go. It doesn't say, therefore, sit in your comfy home and wait for someone who doesn't know Jesus to ring your doorbell, right? In Luke chapter 14, I love this picture that Jesus gives us. It's in a parable. Jesus, he compared the kingdom of God to a certain man who threw a great big party. All the local VIPs were sent, but they all came up with petty excuses and they couldn't come. Verse 21, it says, the servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, hey, there's still more room. So the master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. See, in this parable, the man put himself in proximity to the people he wanted to have an impact on. He went fishing by throwing a party for those who were outcast and hurting. Jesus is saying, look, we have to be intentional about positioning ourselves around other people. You know, Max Licato, well-known author, famous pastor, he had some pretty raw statements about Jesus's proximity to the lost during his crucifixion. Here's what Lucado wrote uh, at one time. He said, Jesus wasn't crucified in a church building over a baptistry between an organ and a piano in front of a bunch of suits and ties. He was crucified on a cruel cross between two hardened criminals. He was crucified not in a nice neighborhood, but at a crossroads so cosmopolitan that the crime had to be written in three languages. He died at the kind of place where thieves cursed and soldiers gambled. And that's, friends, where we need to take the gospel. You know, good fishermen, they position themselves where the fish are. Now, the second fishing tip, good fishermen also understand how fish behave. You know, one of my favorite TV shows that we love watching with our kids is the Andy Griffith Show. It's got a lot of teachable moments in it. And we talk about that with our kids and our family. But one of the episodes, it was one of their original episodes, Aunt B was coming in for a trial visit and she agrees to go fishing to try to fit in. Although you can quickly tell that she doesn't have a clue about fishing. She's fishing with her hook and worm hovering above the water and Andy's stumbling trying to explain to Opie that Aunt B is really using an advanced method of fishing. But clearly you can tell she doesn't know anything about how fish behave. Now look, if we're going to reach people for Christ, we must understand their world, their struggles, their hurts, their hangups. Look, we need to study our culture without buying into it. Think about it. We don't literally have to become a bluegill or a bass or a trout to understand how fish react to their environment. Same goes for being fishers of men. Look, we were all lost at one point, wrapped up in chasing the desires of this world. You know, Romans 3.23 says, For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Good fishermen can learn from their own past struggles and to better understand how to be in proximity to the people that they're trying to reach and understand how they behave. Let us not forget that Jesus, he wasn't talking about catching fish. He was talking about connecting with people who are hurting and lost and bringing them into a saving relationship with him. You know, it reminds me of one of our high school mission trips to El Salvador where we struck up a conversation with a mother of three kids. She invited us into her home. It was a small tin shack, but she was so kind. She made room for the part of our mission trip to come in and chat. And as we shared some of our story and she shared some of her own personal story, we began to understand that she felt like she was not good enough for God that she had shared she made some mistakes in her marriage. And so we spent some time with her sharing what the Bible says about being forgiven and salvation being a gift, not something that we have to earn or be good enough to deserve. And after a while of heartfelt conversations, we asked her if she wanted to start a relationship with Jesus. And she said yes. But friends, if we had not placed ourselves in proximity to her and understood how she was viewing her mistakes, we would have missed the opportunity to be fishers of men. Now, the third fishing tip, good fishermen use a variety of strategies. I was blessed growing up to have all four grandparents in my life. Both sets of grandparents lived on a lake, so fishing was a staple year-round for us kids. Now, my grandpa Turner, he was a special man in my life. His nickname was Gordy. Good old Gordy. I miss him. I get emotional thinking about him because he was just, he was one of those men that everybody wanted to be around. He was lighthearted, caring, just a man's man with a big white beard, former football player, weightlifter with a gimpy leg from polio. <laughs> he was just kind spirited. He never complained. He loved the outdoors. And of course, what was he? He was a fisherman, right? Now, when it came to fishing, my grandpa Turner, he used a variety of strategies to catch fish. 
He would only use a canoe and a rowboat. None of this motorboat stuff or fish, you know, fish finding gear. He was old school for sure. But I remember he had uh, painted the bottom of his canoe. It looked ridiculous, but he spray painted it this old camouflage color. And he said it was a trick the fish into thinking that he was just part of the seaweed of the lily pads. Now he also had homemade baits that he created. And he would fish at staggered times of the day and night, along with using a range of fishing poles. I mean, he was a fisherman who used a variety of tactics and strategies to catch fish. Now, my grandpa, in that situation, was literally trying to catch real fish. However, the Apostle Paul, he gives us a great demonstration on using a variety of strategies to be fishers of men. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9.22, I have become all things to all men, check this out, so that by all possible means I might what? Save some. Yet Paul, he would vary his approach based on his audience. He would talk to Jews differently than Gentiles. He would use intellectual arguments with philosophers or legal arguments with magistrates. But understand, friends, he wasn't trying to manipulate anyone or simply win a debate. No, rather his goal was to connect with his audience in a way that was meaningful to them. Understand Paul's intent and his strategy. His strategy was always out of love and his aim was threefold. One, he wanted to win others by gaining their trust, right? He wanted to save others by sharing the good news of Jesus. And number three, he wanted to follow what Jesus called him to do, to be obedient. See, the gospel is the good news that God has made a way to save us. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Paul says that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. So a good fisherman, what does he do? He positions himself in proximity to people, right? Understands how they behave, their hurts, their hangups, and uses a variety of strategies on sharing the gospel. Now, the fourth fishing tip, good fishermen, they expect to catch fish, right? Think about it. If you're on vacation and let's say you sign up for one of those deep sea fishing experiences, I bet you expect to catch some fish, right? I mean, you have experienced guides. You got all the gear that you need. You are going out with great fishing locations and you're investing in time to catch some fish, right? There's a real effort being put in. Well, friends, guess what? It takes real effort to be a fisher of men. It takes real faith to share your faith with others as well. But understand, you're not putting your faith in yourself or your skills or your knowledge. It's none of that. It's not a matter of being good enough. You're putting your faith in Jesus that he knows how you can be used to help someone else come to know him. You have to believe that Jesus can and will help that person. I mean, that is his responsibility. He's in charge of the results. In Matthew 9, two blind men came to Jesus asking for help. And Jesus said, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, it will be done. Now, if they hadn't believed Jesus could heal them, look, they wouldn't experience sight. It was their faith that was rewarded. In order to be an effective fisher of men, you and I, we have to trust that Jesus can make a difference in the lives of people you know. If you don't expect people to accept Christ, chances are they won't. A good fisherman, see, they place themselves in proximity to the fish while understanding how they behave, varying their strategies, and they expect to catch some fish. Now, fishermen also have this amazing virtue. I think many of you may know it. If you think about it now, the virtue is what? It's patience, right? Good fishermen, they're patient. If they don't catch fish after 20 or 30 casts, they don't pack up and go home. What do they do? They adjust their location. Maybe they change their bait but they have every intention of continuing to fish with the expectation that they're going to catch something. And when they get that bite, boy, is it worth it. But sometimes we as Christians, we get stuck feeling inadequate or unprepared, maybe because we haven't had a great deal of success landing fish. You know, maybe we hear a story of someone else who has led others to Christ and it feels a little intimidating. And we might be thinking, look, I have a hard time even knowing how to start a conversation about my faith with my friends. But take comfort in this. Jesus said, look, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Understand that it's a process. And guess what? The longer you follow Jesus and the more closely you follow him, the more he will make you into a fisher of men. But the Bible says, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield his valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and the spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm. So when you're fishing, Patience is not just a virtue, it's a necessity. You know, not too many fish are just going to jump into our boat, right? Remember, a fish is easily scared, can swim away. A person without Jesus, you know, they might be a little standoffish as well. And we understand that. They may often resist or even resent your attempt to share Christ with them. But that's okay. Love them anyways. And show them God's love. And keep praying for them. 
You know, I know most of you out there have probably been fishing, right? But a few folks tuning in, maybe you haven't. So let me ask, if you have never gone fishing out there, just raise your hand wherever you're at, wherever your computer screen is or phone. Yep. Now the next question is, how many of you who just raise your hand have ever caught a fish? Now, most of you say, wait a second, that's a silly question, right? If they haven't gone fishing, well, of course they haven't caught a fish. Well, that's my point. You know, I don't have to ask how many of you have ever led a person to Christ. Instead, a better question is, how many of you have ever initiated a spiritual conversation with someone? Look, if you don't ever go fishing, for sure you'll never catch fish. Sometimes you go fishing and you don't catch a thing, right? But it's still called going fishing because you went to where the fish were. You tried. Look, friends, God won't ask you how many fish you caught. He's more interested in how many times have you gone fishing. He judges us on our obedience, right? Our job is to share the gospel whether anyone accepts Christ or not, those results we leave up to God. Friends, thank you for the time today. Let me pray for us as we think about being fishers of men. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you today just grateful, Lord, for the plans you have in place for our lives, Lord, that you have called us into the opportunity to be a part of your ministry, Lord, and that you have said you will come alongside us and allow us to become fishers of men. You will allow us to be able to be used so that others may come to know you, Lord. What an amazing gift and opportunity that is. And Lord, there are some out there today who may not know you. Lord, I just pray that they connect with you, Lord, that you open their heart and they understand that, look, it's not about being good enough. It's not about knowing certain things, Lord, it's all about a relationship with you. It's a relationship with you that you love them, you care about them, and that if we ask you to forgive us of our sins, and you, Lord, allow, we allow you to be a part of our life, Lord, that you will come in and change us from the inside out. Lord, what an amazing gift that is. Lord, as we come before you today, Lord, allow us to be bold for you, allow us to share with others and have confidence, Lord, that we can help be fishers of men in this world. In your name we pray, amen. Wow, thank you so much. Caleb, man, just learning to be fishers. Oh, man, I know I love fishing myself, but man, just such a great perspective of how we incorporate that into our lives, into our faith. Thank you, Caleb, for that message. I know it meant a lot to me, and I know it meant a lot to other people. Hey, guys, two things for you as you leave. First, if you want to give, uh, right here, there is an awesome link that you can text to give to. It's just a great opportunity. If you love what the Point Church is doing and you're a part of our church, we would love for you to give towards that mission towards that goal of helping people find and follow Jesus. And secondly, guys, follow us on our social media pages. Um, we post an awesome amount of great content and just pictures of the people and smiley faces and sometimes some even inspirational stuff about what we learned from our lessons. And so we would love for you to follow us, stay connected with us that way. It's a great way to see what the church is doing. And so we would love for you to follow us. And also you can just text to give as well. Thank you so much for being a part of the service today. We're so appreciative that you came here today. And we love you guys.